Welcome back to More Fun with Finance. I'm Dr. William Elliott, coming to you from beautiful uptown Shaker Heights. And this lesson is about capital structure. We've actually got two chapters that delve into the topic of capital structure. It's a very important part of corporate finance, picking the correct capital structure that maximizes firm value is part science, part art. And we'll talk about all the various factors that influence that and, uh, and how you can better make a, uh, a value maximizing decision. So without any further ado, let me jump out of the way here and we'll switch over to the slides. So um, I'm going to be using uh, some material that's a little bit different from your textbook. Um, I'm happy to go through the text with you via the discussion forum or in office hours if you have any questions. But I think this particular presentation not only will seeing something a little different possibly help you to better understand it, but I think it's a, a, a better uh, presentation. It's, it's more uh, direct and to the point. So uh, bear with that uh, difference. So this is, will not track one-to-one -one with the chapters. So we're going to first uh, describe several different views of capital structure. Um, we'll look at how these views depend upon market imperfections. And then we'll explain how these imperfections lead to some sort of preference. And then we'll evaluate the firm's capital structure and, uh, and weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so does capital structure matter? What's the role of income taxes, agency costs, and financial distress, external financing transaction costs, financial leverage clientels, and then capital markets imperfections view of capital structure. All right, so let's start off with just some overarching principles that we're going to find hold true when it comes to capital structure. One of them is incremental benefits. So we, in, in terms of incremental benefits, what is it about the capital structure decision that relates to incremental benefits? Well, we are trying to minimize the value loss to these capital market imperfections. What are capital market imperfections? Transaction costs, agency costs, information asymmetry, uh, those are examples of capital market imperfections. We, we usually start our models out by assuming a very perfect marketplace uh, that has none of these imperfections, none of the reality of the world, and we come up with a model that makes sense, and then we start relaxing these uh, assumptions about the perfect capital market to better reflect the reality. Uh, tackling it all at once is, is too daunting a task. So the typical method is to, is to start off with a whole bunch of assumptions. No taxes, no transaction costs, no agency costs, no information asymmetry. So we don't have a lot of the problems that we do have in the real world. And you'll notice that this discussion, and as you read through the chapters, it also follows chronologically that order. The theory and the work that you're going to see initially really dates back to the late 50s, early 60s of the 20th century with the work of Medigliani and Miller, the M&M, the so-called M&M uh, propositions. And then as you see uh, more and more uh, relaxation of the assumptions, you'll notice that uh, that's moving forward in time. So into the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, when we've fully developed uh, a complete model uh, and relaxed most of the assumptions, it's still a very difficult area and a very difficult task. We're never going to get it perfect. There's still tons of work going on looking at capital structure and, and analyzing the value propositions related to changes in capital structure. Second uh, principle uh, relates to signaling. Financing transactions and capital structure changes might convey information to outsiders. 
So we always have to keep in mind that no matter what we do, shareholders, debt holders, other uh, uh, constituents of the firm are going to look at our actions and make an interpretation about why we did what we did. All right. And if these are costly signals, we can actually use this to transmit information to the outside world that would otherwise be difficult to transmit. So there may be a CEO could walk up to a microphone and say, our company is the best company in the world. Well, okay, great. Prove it. Well, doing some capital structure changes, those are potentially costly if you're not the best company in the world. And if you saddle it up with a whole bunch of debt, um, you know, that, uh, that's taken quite a huge bet. And uh, so it's, it's one of those things, uh, put up or shut up, basically. But signaling is another important principle that we'll be uh, de delving into and dealing with. Time value of money it also comes into play here. Um, in particular, the time value of money of the tax benefits and, and, and tax costs. Um, time value, even if we have a sum of total tax benefits or costs that are equal to one another, regardless of when they occur, if we push them off into the future, they become smaller. So if it's a benefit, we'd actually want to move it closer to us. Uh, if it's a cost, we could push it out into the future and make the present value of that tax burden much, much smaller. In fact, many investors do that, especially with equity. So if you buy equity and you never sell it, and let's say it doesn't pay any dividends, you never pay tax on it. And whatever tax you do pay is decades off into the future, and the present value of that expense is tiny, minuscule. So that's an example of how time value of money can come into play when it comes to capital structure. And then valuable ideas is another principle here. Uh, for example, we might, it might behoove us as a corporation to issue securities that are short in supply because they tend to command a higher price. And as a result, we could we, we could get more money for the security that we're selling if there's greater demand in the marketplace for it. Take, for example, uh, convertible bonds. A lot of hedge funds use convertible bonds as a strategy. They'll buy convertibles and they'll short the company stock. I won't go into the details. It's, it's a fairly uh, complicated situation, but you generate cash flows in multiple ways. The, the short position constantly is changing. You're earning interest uh, from the, uh, the bond and so forth. But bottom line is that, um, you know, if a security is in short supply, you can get a better rate. So in the case of convertibles, uh, we could offer a, a lower coupon rate than we might be able to offer in, uh, in a convertible if hedge funds were not demanding convertibles to use that in, as part of their uh, strategy in their portfolios. Okay, what is a perfect market? Just what it says. Um, it is, it, it's a market in which there are no imperfections such as transaction costs. No taxes, no asymmetric information, by asymmetric information, do you, do you know what I mean? What that means is that everybody is informed equally well uh, about the situation and everybody knows everything about everything. Yeah, we know that's not quite realistic. Um, there is no, um, let's see, taxes trend. Oh, agency, uh, no agency costs. And again, I don't know how well agency costs, uh, translates to you all. So, uh, by the way, it, you know, if, if there's anything and I, I, if I forget to mention, uh, a definition for what something is like agency costs, 
jump into Investopedia or Wikipedia, but agency costs are a very, very important uh, way of looking at a financial world, uh, transactions, companies, investors, and so forth. There are many, many agency costs. Simply put, an agency cost has two parties, a principal and an agent. And the agent is performing in lieu, a task in lieu of the principal. Um, and the situation is attempting to get the agent to do what the principal would do were the principal taking all of the actions on their own. So one way to do that is to write up a contract. We could have the contract uh, have some sort of bonus if the value of the firm is maximized. Um, but that's not the only thing that occurs. We also have to worry about uh, prerequisites, uh, or excuse me, uh, uh, perks, uh, prerequisites, and uh, you know the 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 case in point, um, RJR uh, Nabisco. There's an old story about that, and uh, as a as a dog lover, I don't know how many of you are dog lovers as well, but uh, I I don't know. I I almost uh, you know I'm, I'm happy for the dog. But uh, the story goes that the CEO of RJR, Nabisco, um, would fly his dog, uh, and I think it was a German Shepherd, and they, they hold a particular soft spot in my heart, too, having uh, had many German Shepherds. We have one right now. Cheyenne is right here with me. If you hear any uh, moving about, that's probably Cheyenne. Uh, but the, uh, so the CEO of RJR, Nabisco, at one point flew his dog to the dog's birthday party on the corporate jet. Yeah, well, that's probably not a good use of corporate assets. Um, so, yeah, that's a agency cost. Um, and they're everywhere. We've got one right here. You're trying to show me that you have a particular understanding of this material, A, B, C, and I'm trying to figure out what understanding you actually have. Now, you could come in and tell me, hey, I've got an A understanding of the material. I deserve an A. But, of course, that's a costless signal. So there's a signaling aspect into, your, into this, too. And so what you actually have to do is to do that work, put in that effort to get the homework done, get it done on time, do well on it, uh, use the discussion forum, use office hours, listen to the videos through multiple times, and then also do well on the exam. That's costly. And so I see that as a as a credible signal, as opposed to the non-credible signal where you say, oh, I've got to get an A or I've got to get a B for reason X, Y, or Z, trying to play on my sympathies. Um, by the way, that won't work. <laughs> anyway, um, on to the rest of capital structure here. We're going to use this example throughout this discussion. It's Mediforms, Inc., ticker symbol MFI. So we're just going to shorthand the, the name with MFI throughout the rest of the example. Right now, it's an all-equity firm. In other words, it has no leverage. It has no debt. It's 100% financed with equity. So they issued some stock at the beginning and they invested in capital assets and um, are producing some sort of product. The expected annual cash flows and this expectation here is not just the typical use of expected. It's actually the expectation of a variable, in this case, annual cash flows. The expectation is a mathematical, fancy way of saying the long-run average, all right? So the average cash flow is $300 per year, never to get less than $100. And the reason for that will be revealed a little bit later on. Basically, that's going to be our interest payment. So if the cash flows never drop below the amount of the interest payment, then we never go into uh, bankruptcy and we, we never become not, uh, unsolvent. Um, our, also, shareholders require a 15% rate of return for this all-equity 
stake. All right. So we're going to look at a few things. We're going to look for the total value of MFI. We're going to look for the value of its equity. And we're going to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. So with the expected cash flows, the average cash flows, that is, at 300, the value of MFI's uh, equity is 300 scaled by the cost of equity, 15%. Remember, we're also making an assumption here, by the way, that this is a perpetuity, just to simplify things. So since it's a perpetuity, remember that the, the price of the perpetuity or the value of a perpetuity is the cash flow divided by the required rate of return. All right, so that's how we get this 300 divided by 15% or 0.15, and that turns out to be a firm value of $2,000. Now, since the firm has no debt, the total firm value, and we're going to use V sub U to represent the firm value of the unlevered or 100% equity firm. Uh, the firm value is 2000 and since the equity is 100% of the firm financing wise, the value of the equity is also 2000. And then the WAC, well, 100% of the financing is equity. So 100% of the weight on the cost of equity capital means that our WAC is 15%. So our calculations were quite easy in this example, they're not going to stay that easy. Okay, everybody staying with me so far? If not, go back, review the, the prior two slides or so, uh, because it, we're going to continue to use this example and we're going to add some complications. So make sure that you're uh, feeling like this is okay. Okay, so now we're going to add some debt to this firm and we're going to sell $1,000 worth of debt. That debt has a coupon of 10%. And we're going to use the proceeds from that debt to pay back the shareholders. Think of it this way. We're either going to do a special dividend of $1,000 to the shareholders, funded entirely from the debt issue, or you could also think of it as a repurchase. A repurchase is where a firm takes an amount of cash and buys back its own stock. Either way is going to be similar. Um, there are some differential tax consequences between dividends and repurchases for the individual shareholders, but let's not talk about that at the moment. We can think of it as similar actions that allow the firm to, um, uh, to give back that $1,000 to shareholders and use, uh, and now it's financed partially with debt. So we're going to ask similar questions. What's the total value of the firm? What's the value of MFI's equity? Now we're going to add a couple of items. Shareholders' wealth, we want to check on that. And then leverage. And then also like the prior problem, we're also going to calculate the WAC. Weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so total firm value is simply the value of the debt plus the value of the equity. And the value of MFI's equity is, well, the value of the original firm minus the $1,000 of debt, so 1000 Okay. So prior to the capital change, MFI's equity was worth 2000 So have shareholders lost value? No, no, not at all because they still have equity worth a thousand and now they also have a thousand dollars in cash in their pockets. If they wanted to put it at risk, they could go out and buy more shares of a similarly risky company, or they could even buy shares from another shareholder of MFI. So shareholder wealth remains unchanged. Very important uh, result here. So now, using a pie diagram, we have that the value, let me get out of the way here, the value of the unlevered firm 
over here and the value of the levered firm are identical. It's just who's funding what. Remember, this is in perfect capital markets. No taxes, no transaction costs, no agency costs, no signaling, um, and, and no other imperfections in the marketplace. No asymmetric information. And there we have our animation for the evening. All right. All right, shareholders required return in perfect markets at 10%. MFI's annual interest expense is $100. Now, here's the problem. That original cash flow, shareholders got all of it. Now, debt holders jump in front of shareholders and grab $100 out of that average $300. So now, shareholders only end up with $200 worth of cash flow. Remember, there are no taxes in this world still, so don't worry about taxes, no transaction costs. Well, if all of a sudden I'm getting only $200 from a firm, and remember, this is the average, 300 is the average, it could be above that, it could be below that, so it's kind of magnifying my risk as a shareholder, and since it magnifies my risk, I have higher risk, I'm going to demand a higher return. The question is, how high? How much higher? Well, we know that equity is worth 1000 We know that equity gets $200. So that means that actually our required rate of return turns out to be 20%. All right. So with that leverage, we have riskier equity. And so the shareholder's required rate of return goes up from 15 percent with the all equity firm up to 20 percent. Now we need to calculate leverage and we're going to call leverage L in this case. So the leverage can be measured one of multiple ways as you saw in one of the prior uh, chapters. Um, in this case we're going to take debt over assets or firm value and so we take the market value of the debt divided by the firm value, that's 1,000, divided by 2,000, gives us 0.5 or 50% leverage. The other 50% obviously is financed with equity. Now that we have leverage, we have the, the cost of equity, we have the cost of debt, um, we're going to be able to, and, and for the moment, actually ignore this. We're not in a taxable world yet. So we have 1 minus the leverage. So it's 1 minus 0 0.5 times R sub E. And that is the required rate of return on equity. That's going to be our 20% plus the leverage, again, 0 0.5, times R sub D, the cost of debt, and that's 10%. And, huh, interesting. Turns out that that's also a 15% weighted average cost of capital, just like the all-equity firm. Now, remember, this is part of that Medigliani and Miller proposition, and so the M&M proposition in a perfect world with no taxes, no transaction costs, turns out that WAC is actually constant throughout all levels of leverage. In other words, capital structure is meaningless. Now, Medigliani and Miller knew that that wasn't true, but this was the first model that they posited. And remember, we start off with something simple and then we build up. So, since WAC is the same, that also tells us that value 
of the firm is going to be the same across all levels of leverage, from none to 100% debt financing. Or you got to have somebody to own the firm, so 99% debt, 1% equity. But no matter where we are on that continuum, the value of the firm is the same because the weighted average cost of capital is the same. So we'll have the same number of projects, we'll have the same MPV of those projects, and the value of the firm is really the sum of the MPV of the projects in the firm. All right? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to get into an arbitrage argument to prove our point that we just showed. And arbitrage arguments are used quite often in, in finance to prove a point. Um, we can figure out the value of a futures contract using an arbitrage. And that arbitrage is actually the alternative to a futures contract. You know, if I were to, let me just give you a, a brief example. Let's say that we were, um, we were interested in buying corn. We're a cereal manufacturer. We want to lock in the price of our inputs to our cereal. So we're buying corn. We don't know what the price of corn is going to be at the end of harvest because we don't know whether it's going to be a, a large harvest or a small harvest. How is the weather going to modify that? What sort of competition is there in the market for corn? That sort of thing. So what we might do is to buy a futures contract, which gives us the right to buy corn in three months or six months or nine months from this date. So how do we price that? How would we know? Let's say corn is $5 a bushel today. Well, how do we know what a fair price for a futures contract on corn six month for six-month delivery? How do we know what that is? And the answer is, I don't know. Don't know what it is. Now, if we've got a futures market there, we could observe the price in the futures market, but where did that come from? Well, it's simple. There's an arbitrage argument behind it. And that is because I can create a similar position to a six-month futures contract on corn without the futures contract. How do I do that? Well, what I could do is at time zero today, borrow money, buy corn, store corn. All right. Now, remember, I said. A pure arbitrage, we use none of our own money. That's why we're borrowing. And we use that money that we borrowed to buy corn. And we haven't touched it yet. We're just going to put it in storage somewhere. And it's going to stay there for six months. Now, over that six-month period, some things are going to happen. We're going to accrue some interest do on our loan. So interest is a factor here. Uh, we're probably going to have some loss of corn due to spoilage, maybe due to rodents. Oh, and we're also accruing storage costs. But if I know what sort of spoilage, and on average I can figure that out, if I want 1,000 bushels, I might have to put 1,100 bushels away. So I have to buy 1,100 bushels. I'll have to store those 1,100 bushels. I'll have to pay interest on the borrowed money. I have to pay for the storage. I lose 100 bushels to spoilage or, or uh, 
eaten by rodents. But at the end of this six-month period, I have my 1,000 bushels. I've paid back my interest. I have paid back my storage costs. And that extra 100 bushels cost me. So those are the three costs related to this. So I know what corn is selling for today at time zero. I think I said $5 a bushel, right? per bushel. So now I have a thousand bushels and it's five dollars plus interest plus storage plus uh, an amount for um, spoilage. And let's say all of those add up to six dollars. So now I know exactly what my futures contract should sell for can't sell for more than six dollars because I could create the same position just like this and this is an arbitrage argument all right we use these everywhere in finance so get used to arbitrage arguments and recognize one when you see it in this case our arbitrage argument is to say well if firms have different leverage but they end up with different values, is there a way of arbitraging that away? If there isn't, then maybe our, our, our statement up here, back here about you know, capital structure being irrelevant is not correct. So let's walk through that arbitrage argument. Um, consider another firm. We have MFI, but now we have another firm called U. It's identical to MFI before the capital structure change. The uh, firm L is identified I, is is identical to MFI after the capital structure change. All right. So, however, firm L has equity that is not a thousand dollars. It's actually valued at $1,500, whereas MFI's equity is valued at $1,000. Remember, they're identical. That can't be. How does that go away? It goes away through an arbitrage. Let's see what that arbitrage is. Oh, right, one last item. They... Uh, firm L's total value is 2500 obviously, because its equity is 1500 All right. Suppose that you own 10% of Firm L. That means you own 10% of the equity. That's $1,500. 10% of that is $150, right? You're entitled to 10% of Firm L's cash flow. And again, remember, the cash flows are not different. It's just the valuation that's different. So the cash flow is 200 and you get 10% of that, so you get 20 bucks. Now, we're going to sell our shares of L. Remember this $20. I'm going to come back to it. We're going to sell our shares of L. And then we're going to borrow a little more money. We're going to borrow $150 at 10%. Now we have $300 in cash. So we have 150 of our own money, another 150 that we borrowed. So we have personal leverage of 50%. Now, we're going to buy $300 of firm use stock. Since use equity is worth 2000 we now own 300 over 2000 is 15%. We're entitled to 15% of use cash flows. 15% times 300 gives us $45 from Firm U. Everybody 
standing up. Just nod your head. Yes. Thank you. All right. After paying $15 in interest, right, because we borrowed 150 at 10%, uh, so that's our interest payment there, we are left, your, our annual cash flows um, increased from 20 to 30. Remember, we had, we're back here, we had $45. We're going to be paying 15 of that in interest, and we're still left with 30, which is better than the 20 we had with Fermel. This arbitrage opportunity cannot exist in perfect markets. I mean, everybody would be doing this, right? Well, when everybody does do this, when they sell their shares of Firm L and buy their shares of Firm U, what happens to Firm L's equity? If you have a lot of supply of shares in the marketplace, there it goes, down. Demanding shares of firm use equity drives that up. So in equilibrium, they're going to come out to have the same value. There's our arbitrage argument. Uh, as they say, QED. All right, now, now we go on to adding corporate taxes or what I would also call relaxing an assumption of perfect capital markets. Now our markets are still otherwise perfect, but we've allowed for taxes. All right, so in this case, with taxes, we know that the tax laws allow us to deduct interest payments from our income before calculating our taxes. However, dividends are not treated in that fashion. So dividends get taxed at the corporate level and at the individual level. Hold that in mind too because we'll come back to that. All right. So this is what we in uh, economics call an asymmetry. The tax treatment is differential or asymmetric from debt to equity. And it makes debt financing cheaper than equity financing, right? So the corporate tax view of capital structure implies that firm value is maximized when the firm is all debt. Or again, we've got to have some, some owner, 99% debt, 1% equity. Let's look at that. I mean, we, I've kind of, we've kind of jumped to the end of this with this assertion, but let's, let's prove that. Let's, let's actually look at this example here with MFI again. So MFI has a corporate tax rate of 40%. We're going to compute the value of the equity and the total value of the firm. We're going to start, we're going to go back, we're going to take the leverage away, we're just going to look at the all equity firm and now we're going to have taxes and then we're going to add leverage to it. All right. So think all the way back to that first Medi uh, form example. So we have our $300 cash flow, but now 40% of that goes to Uncle Sam. And so it, what's left for us is only 60% of that or $180. Shareholders required 15% return, so that 180 divided by 15%, remember this is a perpetuity, that's why I'm doing this this way, uh, so the firm value is $1,200, not 2000 anymore. Why? Well, because 800 of it goes to the feds, to Uncle Sam. All right. Now, suppose we add some debt to the picture. We're going to do the exact same thing that we did in the perfect capital market assumption. 
we're going to add a thousand dollars of debt it's going to have a coupon rate of 10 percent and we're going to use the proceeds to pay back the shareholders now we want to calculate the total value of the firm the value of the equity shareholder wealth the leverage ratio and again whack easy peasy right All right, annual interest on the debt, 10%, $1,000 principal, $100 every year. Uh, that means that our cash flow goes down from 300 to 200 to equity. And then we have still have taxes on that. And that means that we're only left with 120 to the equity stakeholders. Now we know that when we've added that debt in the prior example, equity said, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, 15 isn't good enough, it's riskier, I want 20. So let's use that 20, and we'll use that to calculate the value of the new uh, equity stake. We'll find that that's $600. All right. Now what's the value of the entire firm? Well, we've got debt that we just sold for 1000 so that's the market value of the debt. We have equity that's valued at 600 so the total value of the firm is 1600 Now, the wealth of the shareholders increases from 1200 prior to the leverage change to 1600 after. That's They have that 600 still in stock, but now they've got $1,000 in their pockets. What a deal. So the entire increase in value of the firm due to the levering up of the firm goes to equity. So they're $400 better off. Let's look at this in a pie, uh, uh, pie graph here. So prior to the leverage, we had the unlevered firm with $1,200 worth of value. Um, again, still the same firm, except that 800 of that value went to the feds. Now, because interest on debt is deductible, and it's about a third of the cash flow, that reduces our debt down to only $400 instead of $800. We have our uh, 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 sorry, that reduces our taxes down to $400, and we still have our debt, and what's left over is our equity piece of $600. And the total value of the firm is $1,600. We don't get to value the part that the government takes. <laughs> Not that that's a bad thing, right? I mean, we need these common goods that the government produces too. Don't want to get into that whole libertarian versus not discussion, but yeah, in, in many regards, there are a lot of common goods where a government uh, properly run is is the optimal uh, outcome. It's, it, it's not the first best outcome. First best would be for everybody to do the right thing, but we know that that's not uh, the world we live in, remember? Uh, so we're looking at second or third best outcomes. Okay, so the gain from leverage is lower ca corporate income taxes. Uh, the unlevered firm was paying 40% on $300 of income, so $120 per year in taxes. As a levered firm, they only paid $80 per year in taxes. So the savings of $40, the difference between the 120 and the 80 is 40 bucks. How did that turn up to be $400 though? Oh, that's right. We saved that every year. So it too is a perpetuity. How do we value a perpetuity? Cash flow or the savings in this case? scaled by the cost or the value well since it's riskless we're always going to get this we discount it at the cost of debt and so the value of that 
tax shield, we call it a debt tax shield, is $400. It increases the value of the firm by $400. So that gain from leverage from the unlevered firm to the levered firm, we go from $1,200 plus the debt tax shield gives us the $1,600 value. Now, you might wonder, well, wait a minute, T times D, how did we get that? That's the tax rate times the principal on the debt. Where did that come from? Well, let me, let me just show you. We, you you're going to see it in another formula later in the, in the deck here, but let me show you right now because I don't want that question to be bugging you. Um, this is how it works, actually. The debt tax shield is the required return on the debt, in our case 10%, times the principal on the debt, in our case 1,000, times the tax rate. That's how much taxes we don't pay as a result of paying interest to debt holders. That numerator is the amount that we don't have to pay. And then to get the value of that today, it's a perpetuity. So we simply scale it by R sub B. With me so far? That gives us the value. Uh, I'm going to write it over here because I don't want to have that end up behind my head. The value of the debt tax shield is that. Oh, yo, wait a minute. You know what? R sub B cancels out R sub B up here. So we don't need any of that mess. So we just get T times D. That's, that's why this is T times D. Makes more sense now, right? I, I hope. All right. Now, let's look at leverage ratio. We have a firm worth $1,600, total value of the firm, scaling the market value of the debt, $1,000. We have a leverage of 62.5% or 0.625. Now we can use that to get our WAC. So let's get our WAC. One minus the leverage times the cost of equity plus the leverage times one, plus, or one minus the tax rate times the cost of debt. And uh, in, in this case, sorry, sorry for the notation variation, your text actually calls it R sub B and the slides that I'm using call it R sub D. Um, I think if I remember correctly, your text does use R sub E for equity. They might use R sub S. I think they do. In any case, you get the idea. This is R sub, this is the same thing as R sub S. And this is the same thing as R sub uh, B. All right, so do the math. Weighted average cost of capital is 11.25%. What was it before? Where is our weighted average cost of capital here? Well, it was 15% in the all equity, or sorry, uh, yeah, 15% in the all equity. So we're down. We're down from 15 down to 11 and a quarter. That's a very good thing. The value of the leverage firm. Oops. Um, the present value of the basic unlevered after-tax cash flow plus, um, oh, sorry, 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 uh, my bad. Um, let me fill in this. I don't know why the uh, symbols disappeared again on me. So what is the, what is the value of the levered firm? Well, and again, here notation is a little different here. This is cash flow. Right, I, I bar is the average cash flow on an after-tax basis. That's the one minus T divided by the WAC now, because 
instead of this 300 going all to equity um, on an after-tax basis. Uh, part of it goes to debt, so we can't discount at the equity cost of capital. We discount at the weighted average cost of capital, which includes equity and debt. And we get, of course, the value of our firm. Here's, here's what really pulls it all together, this handy-dandy little graph. Weighted average cost of capital goes down throughout all levels of leverage. So as I increase leverage, weighted average cost of capital goes down, which means what? Yes, you're right. The value of the firm goes up. So the value of the firm is maximized at 100% leverage. Or again, you know, since we've got to have somebody owning it, 99% leverage and 1% equity. But that's where we want to be. And again, that's a gross oversimplification of the situation, right? I, I, I see you all shaking your heads out there. Yes, that's right. So let's see why firms aren't at 100% equity, or sorry, 100% uh, leverage. Um, it's just kind of a uh, summarization of what we did in the, in the past uh, couple of slides here. So we have the value of the levered firm is simply the value of the um, cash flows on an after-tax basis discounted at R um, plus the value of the debt tax shield. And that is, we can uh, simplify that to this by canceling out R sub D. All right. Um, so we have, we can also rewrite this as the value of the cash flows on an after tax basis scaled by WAC. And if we set these two equations, this equation and this equation equal to one another, because they both are the value of the levered firm, what we can do is restate WAC in a slightly different form than what we looked at. Before, we were looking at the percentage of financing times the cost of financing in that particular, using that particular security. Here, we're actually calculating WAC as the, as the cost of equity in the unlevered firm times 1 minus the tax rate times the leverage. When we do the math down here, lo and behold, we get the same number as we got back, um, right back here. Oh, no, sorry. Right here, right here. 11.25. Okay. And so here's a summary of the formulas that we, we came up with. Um, value the unlevered firm is the cash flows on an after-tax basis. Value the levered firm is the uh, value of the unlevered firm plus the debt tax shield. And that can be rewritten this way as well. And weighted average cost of capital can be written this way if we'd like to. Now, let's bring in personal income taxes. So we're going to keep the corporate taxes. We're going to bring in personal income taxes. Interest and dividend received by investors are is often taxed at regular income rates that's varied over the years um, capital gains are only taxed when the shares are sold though and when you do sell them it depends on wh how long you've held them if it's less than or greater than a year uh, in the current tax regime but even that has varied over time so capital gains taxes can be postponed Capital gains, uh, capital losses can be deducted immediately. And so there is this thing called the tax timing option. And it is valuable. It has value to the equity stakeholders. So from an equity perspective, we can lower our the present value of our tax burden by taking advantage of those options, the ability to postpone gains and realize losses immediately. All right. Now, so 
this lowers the effective tax on shareholder income. The differential between the tax rates on personal income from debt and equity may be in the right circumstances may cancel out the effect of corporate tax asymmetry. So we have tax advantage on the personal level on equity. We have tax advantage on the corporate level on debt. And they might, at certain levels of these tax rates, they might cancel each other out. Right? Let's see. Let's see how that works. All right. So we're going to go back to our old friend here, MFI. We've got those same average or expected three hundred dollars of cash flow per year. Corporate tax rate again is still forty percent. Shareholders pay ten percent uh, income tax on their equity income, so that's represents that some of that tax timing option. So we want to compute uh, the value of MFI as an all equity firm, accounting for now not only corporate taxes, but also personal income taxes. So on the unlevered firm, we still get that $180 per year on an after tax basis. Shareholders pay taxes on this income at 10% and thus end up with $162. Uh, with a 15% required rate of return, we're using an after-tax cash flow here. It's the only one that matters. And so 162 scaled by 15% gives us a value on uh, all equity MFI of $1,080. Let's change the color of this back to red, a little easier to see. All right, now, suppose that MFI does the same thing that it did before, is issue half of that value as debt. So we're going to issue, do a debt issue of $540, and the debt holders require a 10% return. On an after-tax basis, key, that's key, debt holders' tax rate is 46% their personal tax rate. Is it high? Yeah, it's high. But let's just, this is the example. So work with us, All right? Debt proceeds are paid out to the shareholders, just like before. So we're going to compute the value of MFI's equity, the total firm value shareholders' wealth after the capital structure change. All right? So interest on the new debt is $54. On an after-tax basis, um, in order to get that $54 before tax value has to be $100. Uh, after-tax corporate cash flows uh, to the shareholders now is $300 minus that $100. that gets paid out. And the debt holders get $100, but on an after-tax basis, they end up with $54, which gives them an after-tax return of 10% on their debt. All right. So equity stakeholders get 120. Uh, they only pay 10% on their after tax, uh, or, or sorry, they, they only pay 10%. So their after tax personal tax cash flow is 120 times one minus 0.1 or 90% of 120 is $108. Again, with that 20% return, because we put leverage up there at 540, half of the value of the unlevered firm. So they're going to require that 20% again. So $108 scaled by 120, or excuse me, scaled by 20% or 0.2, because remember this is a perpetuity, gives us a equity stake of $540 for the firm. Shareholders have $540 worth of stock. They have $540 from the uh, debt issue that was uh, used to pay a special dividend to the uh, shareholders. So their wealth remains unchanged. Just the form of their wealth. 
if you gave me a dollar and I gave you two 50 cent pieces, would you care? No, I wouldn't care. Unless you gave me a whole pot, unless I had a whole pile of dollars and then might be a weight difference, but you get the point. All right. So total value of the firm uh, is the equity stake plus the debt stake. So we have $1,080. Get out of the way. You can see that. All right. So back to our little handy dandy pie chart. Um, in the unlevered firm, we had corporate taxes. We had personal taxes on the equity. And that gave us a firm value of 1080 Now we add debt to it. And we have debt, uh, personal taxes on the debt. We have personal taxes on the equity. We have the corporate taxes. And then 540 for each the debt and the equity. And lo and behold, now that particular combination of personal taxes on equity and debt and corporate taxes, the personal taxes advantaged equity, the corporate taxes advantaged debt, that completely erases the corporate tax effect that we just saw when we just had corporate taxes, where value was maximized with 100% debt. Now, we're back to that same situation with the perfect capital markets world, where the firm value is independent of leverage. Right? Kind of cool, right? Yeah. All right. And uh, looks like my symbols have gone awry on me. So let me fix that right now. Um, 1 minus the tax rate is equal to 1 minus the tax rate, the personal tax rate on equity times 1 minus the corporate tax rate. Um, and then so this equals that. Um, all right. So that's our finding, is that 1 minus the personal rate on debt is equal to 1 minus the, the personal rate on equity times 1 minus the personal rate on the corporate uh, taxes. And if that, if that equality holds, then leverage, again, is irrelevant. In this world where we have just corporate taxes and personal taxes. Okay? It's kind of an interesting outcome. You can see how we can play around with this stuff. Now we're going to look at some things that are more intangible. We're just going to talk through the, some of the items. And this is really more where the art piece of it comes in. All right. So first thing we're going to touch on is the agency cost view of capital structure. So capital market imperfections resulting from agency costs considerations create a complex environment in which capital structure can affect firm value. In what way? Well, there are agency costs with debt, agency costs with equity, between employees and management, uh, between the firm and consumers. All of these things could have an impact on firm value relative to leverage. What are the agency costs of debt? Well, this is usually a uh, relation between Debt, uh, debt holders and equity holders. We have a variety of things that can occur. Asset substitution, claim dilution, underinvestment, asset uniqueness. I'm not going to bore you with details on all of these, but let me give you an example. If you lent some money to a corporation with a particular asset base, you would charge a rate that is consistent with the riskiness of those assets, correct? Again, nod your head if you agree. Um, okay, so issue that debt. We'll, uh, we'll take the cash. And you know what? Tomorrow, I'm going to sell that asset, and I'm going to replace it with a much riskier asset. You're not very happy, are you? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be either if I were you. That's called asset substitution. And because managers are working for the benefit of shareholders, 
maximizing their value, and managers may also be shareholders, this is something they might do. Well, bondholders, you, you all have gotten a little uh, more sophisticated, though. You got burned once, but you're not going to get burned twice, right? So now you're going to put in a covenant that tries to prevent the firm from doing something like that. So you're trying to minimize the agency cost, right? Um, claim dilution under investment and asset uniqueness are all similar agency problems that can cause issues between equity and debt holders. As leverage increases, the potential for this sort of conflict also increases. And the costs of resolving them increase. However, in some degree, at a certain level of debt, we also get some benefits. We get monitoring by any new debt issues. Because you're going to look at that firm inside and out before you lend it money, right? Yeah, as you should. And as a result of that, you're going to discover any of the problems with it, and you're going to write that into the debt co as part of the debt covenant. You might also, if you're really concerned, say, hey, um, you know what? We need a sinking fund provision. A sinking fund, again, I won't, I won't go into great detail, but basically what a sinking fund does is it requires the firm to start paying back the debt earlier than the final maturity date, or at least set aside funds such that um, those funds are available to debt holders for repayment of their principal. And then we could also have some sort of security. We could use an asset uh, as security on a particular debt. So if the corporation were not able to pay back the principal, then the debt holders could repossess that asset and then sell it and use that to recoup their principal. Okay. There are agency costs associated with obtaining any sort of financing. Um, agency costs associated with other firm claimants as well, employees, customers, society in general. And you, you just open up the Wall Street Journal any day and you're going to see that sort of thing showing up. The optimal capital structure in this agency cost view of capital structure, the optimal is the level of leverage that minimizes the sum of the total agency costs. So this is another, just another perspective, another way of looking at capital structure. Now, we look at the bankruptcy cost view of capital structure. Again, uh, capital market imperfections associated with financial distress and bankruptcy offset other benefits from leverage created by taxes and agency. What do I mean by that? Well, as I increase my leverage, I also increase the probability that the firm will have insufficient income to pay all of the interest payments due to the bondholders. Ergo, I go into bankruptcy. All right. And there are some costs to bankruptcy. There are both direct costs and indirect costs. The direct costs are fairly de minimis, relatively speaking, uh, meaning uh, minimal. So we have court fees, court, uh, legal, legal fees, court costs, notification costs, only if the actual bankruptcy occurs. Uh, and these are generally relatively small. It's the indirect costs, though, and those, those have actually been uh, um, accounted for by some of the previous literature. There's been uh, numerous studies. Uh, Altman uh, is, is the, the most pro, uh, widely cited study in bankruptcy. And the direct costs are really minimal. 
uh, it's the indirect costs that are going to get them. So the indirect costs is the reduced price for firms, uh, the firm's goods and services. That can be the largest one. Management time devoted to dealing with this bankruptcy. If it's a Chapter 11 reorganization, it's a non-trivial activity. Management has to be involved. They should be running the company, but no, they're dealing with lawyers and courts and, and uh, debt holders. May lose some tax credits. We certainly lose some sales and goodwill. Right? Who wants to buy from a company that's in bankruptcy? I mean, yeah, yeah. Chrysler, back when it went into bankruptcy, said, yeah, we're going to set up a company that will take care of all of your warranty work. Yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry. Not, still not going to buy a Chrysler. Um, that dates me, I know. But, you know, any company. Think, think of any company that's recently gone bankrupt. Would you have wanted to buy their products? No. <laughs> Probably not. Even if they did make good on their warranty, maybe the employees were so unhappy and so badly treated by management that they did a terrible job building the product or maybe even purposefully uh, created problems for the products for the end user to, to accelerate the, the demise of the firm because they were being treated poorly or agency costs. All right, so the expected costs of bankruptcy um, depend really upon the degree of specialization of the firm's assets. If they're highly specialized, they don't have much of a market value. They're not good collateral. Um, are they tangible or intangible? Are they physical or are they some sort of patent or other intangible? That too can have an impact on their value and how easily they could be sold to cover the bankruptcy. As leverage increases, the expected bankruptcy costs increases, the average bankruptcy costs. Uh, this increase offsets the benefits that we just looked at with regard to agency costs or personal and corporate taxes. Here's yet another theory that uh, we, we talked about agency a little bit. Signaling is a very important theory in, in most of finance and can be used quite widely to better understand why financial firms do what they do, why investors do what they do. So how does it relate to capital structure? Well, a firm's decision about its financing um, is a choice about capital structure. That may convey some information to the marketplace that was heretofore unknown. So remember, in this world, we have removed one of those other perfect market conditions. We have asymmetric information. And as an investor, I'm trying to figure out what the company knows that they can't tell me or that they are unable to reliably and credibly tell me. They can only actually tell me through their actions and actions that would be costly if they lied. That's what signaling is all about. There's credible signals and then there's BS. Listening to any leader spout off about whatever they're spouting off about is meaningless. Has no signal, no credible signal. But watching what they do you bet if they're putting dollars behind something, yeah, now that's a credible signal. So if a project has a large positive NPV, I'd rather hang on to most of that if I were the firm. So I'm going to try to fund that project with a internally generated funds. So that retained earnings, right? I've done well on other projects. I've got a big pile of retained earnings cash. Oh, let's use that. Then my current shareholders get the, the vast majority of the, the gains from this very large positive MPV project. If the project has a small MPV, then, all right, yeah, we'll share with others. 
we won't tell them. But, oh, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, there's that signaling thing, right? So if if we actually go to the external markets, ipso facto, the external markets realize that it's a crappy project. <laughs> oh, well. Um, yeah, you know what? That's what we find in the in, in the empirical data too. When a company announces a equity issue, guess what happens to the stock price of that company on average? Yeah, you're right. It goes down. And we think that's because of this, at least in part, because of this signaling effect. So we're not just making this stuff up. There's... There are thousands and thousands of papers on capital structure on all of these theories, literally thousands of papers. I have written a number of them myself. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, this, is, this is all pretty solidly based upon real-world data. Um, is there a firm or two that has a large positive MPV project that issues equity? Yeah, sure. We're always looking at averages, and there may be something, maybe maybe that manager didn't go to B-School and didn't understand what he was doing and gave away the farm. Um, I don't know. But on average, yeah, this stuff does hold. That's the value of research. That's the value of theory, actually. That's how theory gets developed. Listening to one CEO or a dozen CEOs that somebody brings into your class to tell you some story about what they experienced, that's pretty much a total waste of your time and a, a gross misuse of your dollars that you've paid for tuition because how can you possibly get a real sense of what's going on with a firm just by listening to a dozen or 15 different CEOs? <laughs> it's pointless. Oh, it's entertaining as heck, I'm sure. Much more entertaining than listening to me. <laughs> but are you getting any value out of it? No. Sorry. Uh, that's why we have research. That's why we have theories. We take thousands of observations. We bring them together and we make some inferences about that. We make some decisions about ah, what what would describe this pattern? And then we take that description and we go back out into the marketplace in the future and we test it again. We say, hey, does this actually work? Does this hold up to the real world? Because that, that description you gave had a whole bunch of assumptions embedded in it. But the empiricists go out and test it. So when you are in a class that has a dozen or 15 CEOs, yeah, okay, listen to them, sure. Is it entertaining? Sure. Do I want the entire program based on that? Heck no. All right, on back to signaling. Um, so a project, the way a project is financed can be a signal to the marketplace about the future prospects of that project. Alternatively, if the firm is currently overvalued, existing owners may want to seek outside partners, right? If I can sell you equity at a price that's way above what it should be. Yeah, this, is, this goes back to a question of market efficiency. That's why we talk about market efficiency so much. Market efficiency is important. Um. But there are times when industries and firms and maybe even a general market overall can be misvalued. It happens. At least I believe in the theory that there are occasional deviations, hopefully short, hopefully not too widespread. But there are numerous situations where we've seen market declines uh, preceded by market run-ups, and you really have to wonder. Now, there are other academics, to be fair, 
that say, no, that's that you're, you're looking at this all wrong. You've got the wrong model. You don't have a factor in your model. And if you had that factor, it would account for this. And actually, the market was not misvalued. So I'm going to be fair about this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm one opinion. A, a large fraction of the uh, academic world believes in that opinion. But then there's another very large fraction of the world that believes in this other direction where it's there's never a misvaluation it's simply our models are just not catching what they should catch there's a factor missing or multiple factors missing but let's say for instance that we could have overvaluation well then i'd really want to sell those securities i've got a couple of papers that relate directly to this we do find significant empirical evidence that firms issue more equity when their values are high and they issue more debt when their values are low relative to some benchmark that we calculated with a model. In fact, it turned out that we, we used the residual income model, actually. If you've had investments, you may uh, be familiar with that model. If the firm is currently undervalued, the firm might use debt financing to keep the gains for themselves. Right, So that provides a signal. So a new equity issue may be a signal of overvaluation. A new debt issue may be a signal of undervaluation. Another factor or another element that we should consider are clientels. How do a particular group of investors with a particular set of characteristics, uh, how do they entertain various types of securities issued by a firm? Well, one in particular could be, let's look at their tax bracket. So one clientele effect could be that investors choose securities based upon what their particular tax situation is. This would lead to what's known as market segmentation. In other words, if I issue equity, there's a subgroup of the market of investors who will buy that equity, but another group will not. And that group would be more interested in my debt issues. It's not a good thing, but it may be a real thing. Investors with high tax brackets, or rather in high tax brackets, will find that debt securities are less attractive. Why? Well, just what we were talking about before. Because they can put off those cap gains forever, basically, till death. Let their kids inherit it. Uh, give it to a charity, on, uh, and they'll never have to pay taxes on it. And they'll actually get a benefit from that charity by you know, being able to deduct that as a uh, charitable giving. Um, so they would be more inclined to buy equity. Uh, whereas investors in a lower tax bracket might prefer debt. So high leverage firms may attract investors in lower tax brackets and uh, vice versa. If the demand for each uh, type of leverage is completely satisfied, then there is no gain from changing the current capital structure. The capital structure would be, again, irrelevant. Pecking order, yet another aspect that we have to consider that's been posited in the literature as a, as a theory. Um, Myers and Majloff brought this to light and, and are cited as the uh, inventors of the pecking order theory of capital structure. And this relates back to that signaling aspect that we were just talking about. But essentially, the firm incurs transaction costs when external financing is used, right? We talked about that in a prior chapter, flotation costs, right? Well, those flotation costs are often quite high, and they're fixed. So small projects or percent flotation costs can be very high. So rather than use external financing, why don't I just fund it with 
internally generated funding from retained earnings. As long as I've kept it in cash, I can do that. Um, so the pecking order says, let's use the cheapest method. And that would be internal. And then we could go to debt financing. And then we could go to some hybrid security like convertible, part, part debt, part equity. And then finally, last resort would be equity financing because that can be the most expensive. So uh, kind of trying to put all of this together, uh, debt is generally valuable, right? At low levels of leverage, the expected uh, financial, uh, the cost of uh, financial distress or bankruptcy is quite low, very low. And we get that tax advantage on the corporate side. Uh, so, you know, we and, and we have some potential agency advantages. L let me describe that agency advantage a little more clearly to you so that you get it. Um, the if, if I have three hundred dollars of cash flow like I had with MFI and a hundred of that is obligated to go out to pay debt holders, I only have two hundred left as a manager. I don't have much room to do other things, right? Fly my dog over to its birthday party on the corporate jet would be right out, right? I've got to mind the store very carefully. If I have th all 300 to myself, hey, I can do a lot more. Um, so basically, we're kind of handcuffing management by adding debt. And that's the agency that resolves some of that agency problem between debt holders and equity holders. Um, as leverage increases, the costs increase, and at some level will exceed the benefits of leverage. Now, here we're going to kind of wrap it all up into one beautiful little picture here. So a V sub L is the total value of the firm. Remember that. That's the very important measure here. V sub T is the net tax benefit from additional leverage. V sub A is the agency cost from additional leverage. And you'll notice that that will go up, but then it will start to go back down. V sub B is the expected financial distress and bankruptcy, which will just start level and then drop off, uh, become negative, uh, become costly. And then L star is the other one that I want you to remember. So remember VL. And remember L star in particular. Here's the graph. So we start with the value of unlevered firm plus tax net tax benefits. Then we have the total agency cost considerations. And notice that what we have on the x-axis here is leverage. And on the y-axis is value. And so there's our V sub A. See, notice that it goes up for a while as we increase leverage, but then as we get to higher leverages, the value of that uh, agency um, story goes down, decreases, becomes negative. And then here we have the bankruptcy issues, and we don't they're, they're zero to a point, and then as we increase leverage beyond that point, then they start to go very negative. And then finally, we have the value of the levered firm right here, the blue line. And notice that this is nonlinear, and notice that it peaks right about here. Also notice that that's consistent with a particular leverage, and that is our optimal leverage, our L star. So we're taking into account the tax issues, we're taking into account agency issues, we're taking into account the, uh, the bankruptcy costs in this graph. And so from this very, uh, very uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, uh, kind of a, a, a hypothetical, um, we have a, a very stylized, that's the word I'm looking for, a very stylized firm 
we can find this optimal leverage. And again, this is not just made up. There's a lot of empirical evidence that backs this up and says, yeah, this is probably a right theory. This, this seems to work in the marketplace. We see this happening. How do we test for this? Well, we look for firms that have a lot of agency uh, problems in them, and we see what, how they manage their leverage. And then we look for firms that have very low agency uh, problems with them, and we look at their leverage, and we see that there's a difference. We do a similar thing with bankruptcy costs, things of that nature. So all of this has been fairly thoroughly tested. Um, also notice here that consistent with what we saw in the prior graph, this blue line, the weighted average cost of capital, is minimized right here at L star, which is also happens to be our uh, L star from the prior graph that maximized firm value. Minimum whack equals maximum firm value. In other words, I get to take on the most projects possible. If I have a higher whack, some projects that would have been positive MPV at a lower whack are no longer positive MPV. They're negative MPV. So my value of the firm goes down, assuming that there's some limited set of positive MPV projects, which I think is reasonable. I mean, in the shorter or midterm, that's true. In the longer term, maybe not so much, but uh, we do live in that short term for the most part. All right. Um, that pretty well wraps things up. Um, we've just got a few um, of these formulas here. And again, I apologize for not having the symbols in here. Uh, da, da, da. This is this is just a summary of what we've already looked at formula-wise. I again I apologize for the lack of consistency with the notation in your uh, in your textbook, um, but hopefully you'll be able to become more flexible because you run into this everywhere in the world. Some people use one letter to rec re represent a particular thing, and others use another. And then this summarizes the, uh, the situation. Let me get out of the way here. Um, this summarizes it with our pie charts. So that perfect capital market view um, leverage was irrelevant. But once we allow for these imperfections, in other words, once we relax the assumptions that are in that perfect capital market view, uh, we find that we can optimize our equity value uh, and uh, by minimizing our tax burdens and not only on a personal basis but the corporate tax burden as well as asymmetric information as well as say even transaction costs get thrown in here. Um, let me tell you an example of why a transaction cost might be in here. If I wanted, if I was at that L star, that optimal leverage, and I've got another project to do, I might ideally want to try to stay at the L star by issuing a combination of debt and equity equal to L star for that individual project. But I've got all these fixed costs. I've got these flotation costs. And I've got flotation costs to equity, and I have flotation costs to debt, and they're both fixed. Why pay two fixed costs on smaller amounts? Why not pay that one fixed cost on a larger amount? We'll move a little bit away from L star, but the next project will use the alternative security, and that'll push us back to L star. And in fact, we could even think about, well, suppose this project pays off handsomely and we get more retained earnings. So we get more equity value and that reduces our leverage. So we could, we, we could issue debt, increase the leverage a little bit 
and then just let leverage naturally glide back down to the L star. Notice that in this graph, um, the L star at, at that point, it's, there's not a lot of curve to it. So we've got a little bit of room, wiggle room here. We don't have to be exactly at L star. We could be a little bit below or a little bit above. And in fact, what I was just arguing is that we might want to go a little bit above with the idea that our retained earnings would very gently slide us year after year back towards that L star again. All right. That pretty well covers uh, capital structure. Here's a bit of a summary. I'm not going to, I'll just leave it up on the screen here for a second. You can pause the video if you want to go back through that. And then finally, this. We want to maximize firm value by balancing the competing effects of the imperfections created by borrowing money. There is no unified theory here, though, unfortunately. And that's why at the beginning of this chapter, I mentioned to you, there is some science, but there's also a fair amount of art. And that's because we don't have a holistic theory that allows us to bring all of these factors to bear on the decision. It's really going to be kind of a seat of the pants thing, uh, a decision made by the executive management team and, and maybe even bringing the board of directors into play because they're, they're a very uh, good knowledge base as well. All right. Have a good uh, rest of your evening, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.